This morning's reading is Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 34. It's on page 970 in the Church Bible. Do not store up for yourself treasures in earth when... No. Sorry, starting the wrong bit. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See the flowers of the field grow. They do not labour or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon, in all his splendour, was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into a fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Ask Rev Tim to come up. <laughs> <laughs> Lord, we we bless Tim this morning as he opens the word for us. May our eyes, hearts and ears be open to all he has been given. Akuna Matata. It means no worries for the rest of our days. It's our problem-free philosophy. Akuna Matata. Don't worry about a thing, because every little thing is going to be all right. I want to tell you a story this morning. It happened about 18 months ago, I think. There of September it will have been. Amanda and I had been to uh, La Paz Optin, which is the spring harvest holiday camp in the Vendée region of France. We were just about to leave. We typed away the uh, Calais into the sat-nav. And it came up with that glorious figure, 424 miles to go. <laughs> Fair few hours in the car. We left the caravan park. Within about two miles, we saw a long line of traffic ahead of us and some flashing lights in the distance. And I thought, oh, well, you know, road works, whatever. We'll get through. As we carried on, though, we realized that as we were moving, so were the lights. They were also moving. And that looked a bit weird. What we eventually found out was we were stuck behind what the French call a convoy exceptionnel. Basically, it means it's a really big lorry. And it's really wide. Now, I'm... Surprise, surprise, not the most patient driver at certain times. <laughs> I get a little bit irate when I get stuck in traffic. I will confess later. This convoy exceptional was so wide that even on the motorway, which in France are two lanes wide, you couldn't overtake. So what were we to do? Well, we carried on down another road. And I said to Amanda, oh, look, the sat-nav shows we can go that way and we can avoid, come off the motorway, go round it and come back on the motorway two junctions further north. Great, we said, let's do that. So off we drive off the motorway, drive on this road all the way around. The sat-nav starts telling us what we're doing, but anyway, it rerouted us eventually. We get to the slip road. We drive down the slip road and what happens? The front escort vehicle pulls up and says, stop, you've got to wait. It's not appropriate for me to repeat what I then said in church. It really isn't, believe me. 
the vehicle passed us. And sure enough, we were stuck behind this convoy exceptional once again. The sat-nav now said something like 416 miles. And we had about nine hours to do a five-hour journey to get to our ferry. Well, me being me, I might not be very patient, but I also like to worry. And I started saying to Amanda, do you know what, love? We're going to miss this ferry. We had 460 miles. And she said, don't be daft. You know, there's plenty of time. It'll turn off before. And I said, no, no, no. That's it now. We're on a motorway. We're going to be following this thing all the way to Calais. We're going to be late. We're going to miss our ferry. I'm not going to be back at work tomorrow. The world's going to end. Oh, dear. <laughs> Amanda was the calming influence that day and said, don't be so stupid. <laughs> and not quite as politely as that either. <laughs> About 20 minutes later... We saw something happen. The light went up the slip road. And I said to Amanda, can it be, can it be that that convoy exceptional is going a different way? Well, sure enough, it did. It drove off that way. We carried on on the motorway, did our other 460 miles, got to the ferry in ample time, and my worry was for nothing. Now that is, of course, it did actually happen, but it's a silly example of worrying. I don't want to belittle any of us, of us here because I know we do worry about really big things. I worry about big things as well. That's just one example because it's a funny story. But as I said in that story, you know, I do catastrophize things in my head all the time and I always think worst case scenario. But then the gospel today says, do not worry. So how does that marry up with being a Christian? when I'm catastrophizing about anything. I heard a bang in the night, and I suddenly thought, oh, that's the tree down on my car, the bins have fallen over, my fence has fallen down, and what's going to happen? Well, I woke up this morning, my bins are still there, my fence is still up. A few branches are down in the garden, but it wasn't anywhere near as bad as I was worrying about. The Lion King, of course, Akuna Matata. Bob Marley, don't worry about a thing. Well, they've got echoes of the gospel passage. But I don't think those two songs actually, oh, well, yeah, they are songs, aren't they? They're both songs. I don't think they actually sum up the message that Jesus is telling us. Because to put this passage into its context, it's part of the Sermon on the Mount. It's quite early on in the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5. And Jesus is telling his followers how to live. And I believe that he's basing it on his own experience of living. As we know, Jesus lived a different life to any of us. He wasn't tempted by sin. But he's telling people how to live. And it's not just live by the rules of this book. It's not just live by the rules of the world. But it's about something more than that. It's about our attitudes and our behaviors as well. It's not okay to simply say, oh, well, I only did 32 in a 30 zone. Guilty, I'm afraid. But it's about our attitudes to that. See, is it, are we going, well, it's okay, it's only a little thing. Or are we actually going and following what he says? It's that mindset change that I believe he's talking about through the whole of the Sermon on the Mount. But for this passage, we can see that he says, do not worry. I'm sure many of you will have heard the phrase, worry is like a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but it doesn't get you anywhere. Well, Jesus tells us, doesn't he? Can any of you, by worrying, add an extra hour to your life, add a single hour? So I wonder, what is it today that you're worrying about? Right now, if I was to ask you, I'm not going to ask for any answers, but what are you worrying about right now? Is it something really small and insignificant, like being stuck behind a lorry? Is it your health? Is it a loved one? Well, I want to tell you something very scientific to help you this morning. Today we'll have 24 hours in it. Tomorrow we'll have 24 hours in it. Whatever it is that you're worrying about, it's not going to extend the time. Time will still pass in the same way. But I think what Jesus is actually telling us is to live in the present. 
and try not to worry about those small things. And actually, taking that a step further, I think this passage is comes down to how much do we trust God? Because worry can become fear. And if we let fear fester, it can sometimes become the opposite of faith. So what we need to do is to put our trust in God. Put our trust in our Heavenly Father and cast our burdens on Him. As you well know, there's lots of references to this in Scripture. One example, 1 Peter 5, 7, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. So this morning, whatever it is that you're worrying about, whether it be big or small, leave them at the foot of the cross. Take them to the Lord and leave them there. Because if we cast our cares on God, it will help to set us free from our worries. But it is important to also say that I don't think Jesus is saying to never worry at all in this passage. It's part of our human nature. It's part of the human condition. And if we don't worry at all, that's unattainable. And it would actually put people off being Christians. We need to seek God and cast our anxieties on him. I've got a few props that I want to see if this is going to work to help illustrate this. So bear with me. I've got a box here. Labeled life. What are the sort of things that we worry about? And what, what forms part of life? Just chat out a few answers. What do you think? What, what do you think about all the, all the time? Getting old? I haven't got a prop for that one. I've <laughs> got a few props in here. What are the sort of things that perhaps we worry about? Money, the wife's purse, you know, (laughs) anything else? What we eat, yeah, what we eat, what else? Health, yep, family, I wasn't allowed to put the teddy in the box for the during the service. But yes, the teddy symbolizes family, children. Yep. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) I've got another four things in my box. Work. Yep, work. Accommodation. Yep, absolutely. Home. Well done. What else? We've had health. Yeah. The clothes that we wear. And I've got one more thing. A little bit topical at the moment, unfortunately, but entertainment. I mean, I know we don't really worry about it, but it forms part of our life, doesn't it? What we do. So all of that goes in our box. That's a problem, though. The lid doesn't fit. So where does God fit into this? How does God fit into our lives? If we've got all of this stuff that's going on, it doesn't really work, does it? But what we can do, as Jesus tells us, and I find the right side, is if we seek first God, and we put God at the front of everything, All of life fits in. Everything fits in. So do we put God first? Or do we worry about those little things? This summarized, I saw, I, this isn't my original illustration. I saw it quite a number of years ago now and it's always stuck with me. But it helps me to think about this in a different way. Because Jesus is saying to us, seek first the kingdom of God. And if we put God first, then those smaller things in life somehow don't seem as bad. And we don't need to worry about them anymore because God is big enough. And God is not restricted to this box. God is so much bigger than that, but it just forms part of our illustration. But actually the box 
well, we shouldn't put God in a box at all, but it's so big that there isn't anything that can contain God. And I know you know that. But if I'm really honest with you, I find doing this difficult. Because the things creep into my mind and my life box gets full and I forget and I try and forget that actually God is bigger than all of that sometimes. But what I think when I come to that point is actually it doesn't matter that I worry about the things because what I can do is take them back to God each time. Because God is so big, he's big enough to handle my little worry. So I can take it back to God and he will still listen. I can cast that anxiety on him again. I think the problem actually comes when we stop taking our worries back to God. When we stop taking what's worrying us back to the Lord, that's when it starts to become a lack of faith. And that's what I think Jesus is getting at in our reading today. He knows we're all going to worry. He knows us. He created us along with the Father and the Holy Spirit. So he knows how we work. The Holy Spirit knows us so well that it, it intercedes, the Holy Spirit intercedes for us when we don't know what to say, when we're groaning. He knows us. And I also think that when we start thinking like that, this passage helps us connect with those on the outside of church. Because too many people think, oh, you're a Christian, you've got it all sorted, you know everything. Well, we know sat here today, that's not the case at all. No matter what it is, we can talk to people and say, well, actually, I struggle with that as a Christian. And that in itself is a great form of evangelism because it shows people that we don't have all the answers and we never will have all the answers. But the message of this passage is to trust God with our worries and he will help us through them. It's not for us to stop worrying completely as the Bob Marley lyric says because that's unattainable. As we know, God never asks us to do anything or give us something that's too big for us. He equips the called. He doesn't call the equipped. He knows us better than we know ourselves. If we think back to Dean, what Dean said last week, Philippians, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. To so whatever it is that when I asked you, what are you worrying about this morning? You can get through it. It might not be easy. I'm not saying it will be easy. It will be a walk in the park. But you can get through it with the Lord walking at your side. Whether it be big or small. Whether it be that you're worried about walking into that office tomorrow. The Lord has gone before you and the Lord will go with you. If you have a hospital appointment this week. Or a friend of yours or a family member. The Lord will go with you. If you receive bad news, it's not going to stop the bad news. The Lord will not stop that news coming. But he will be with you as you listen to whatever news it is. God is big enough to handle all of that. And that's what I think the message is of this passage. Do not worry. I know I said a couple of weeks ago I wouldn't use Greek, but I'm going to go back to Greek because in the, if you look at this passage in the Greek... It's not, do not worry. It's not a one-time thing. Well, don't do it ever again. It's not written like that in the Greek. It's written in the present tense, meaning it's a continuous thing. So actually, it probably should be, go on not worrying. Keep, you know, keep going back to the Lord. It's a continuous action of do not worry. It's not a command. It's an action. And I think it's something we need to be reminded of, not just in the church, but in the world. I shared a little bit of the 8.30 this morning and somebody said, well, there's so much worry in the world. And there is, it's true. And then they said, well, actually, if I can't worry, can I have concern? Yes. Concern is different. We can still have our worries, but we just need to keep taking them back to God. In the passage, Jesus uses some wonderful imagery from nature to illustrate his point. But sadly, I wonder if some of that is lost on us today. Our lives are often so busy that we don't get chance to spend time with nature. Jesus presents things to us in the passage. The birds of the air get the food they need. The lilies of the field grow. Even though a human pair of eyes may never see some of those birds. 
human eyes may never see some of those flowers that God's created. But that doesn't matter. Because God still takes the same amount of care and time over creating that flower or creating that bird that no human eye will ever see. So if God is worried about the detail of a flower, that daisy perhaps you drove past this morning, if there are any at the moment, might be the wrong time of year. Snowdrops, they're around at the moment, aren't they? Maybe that snowdrop that you drove past. It may be that snowdrop that appeared yesterday that's now gone because of Storm Dennis. God took as much care over that as the flowers here or as the flowers on a loved one's grave. So if he can do that over a flower, he can do that over you. So if you're feeling small or insignificant this morning, know that the Lord loves you just as much as anybody else in this room. He can do that. Jesus tells us we need to be more like the birds and know that God will provide for us. It's easy for me to stand here and say these things on a Sunday morning. But I wonder, if I was preaching somewhere in the world where there's famine at the moment, I'm saying, well, don't worry about your food, don't worry about your drink. It wouldn't be as easy. Because there'd be people there who would be dying that day. People will die today from malnutrition. But I wonder, if we were to preach this passage and speak to somebody about this, would they worry about their food? Would they worry about their clothes or their drink? Or would they simply worry about, will I make it to the end of the day alive? Puts it into perspective. Going back years ago, before I even considered ordination, when I was running a youth group in, uh, in Ilkley, a member of our group went to Tanzania on a mission trip. And he gave a talk to the youth group when he got back. And he said, I was amazed by how thankful people there were to God. They would thank him for the meal. They would thank him for their clothes. They'd thank him for their house every day. They'd walk around and go, thank you for this bottle of water. Have we lost that in our country because we feel too entitled and privileged? We know that we can go to the co-op and there'll be you know, plenty of choice. Not just bottled water, clean water. But plenty of other options. If we don't fancy water, well, there'll be Pepsi or Mountain Dew or Tango. There's all the different choices we have. Have we come too accustomed to that? And we forget to thank God for the very basic things. I know personally most of my prayers seem to be asking God for things. I try not to do the shopping list prayer. But I'm sure I've shared this before. A few years ago I was challenged in Lent to take something on. And I started saying thank you to God. Every night I would stop and go, where were you with me today, Lord? And often I'd say so many thank yous I'd forget to even ask the please. Because God, I noticed, was with me in everything that I did that day. Often it had been when I was walking into the office, which towards the end of my time in law, I found really hard. I've been there. I didn't want to go into that office. When I had to make that really difficult call to a client who I knew was going to kick off and shout at me, God was still with me. I had to do it. I was, I was the, the lawyer that was dealing with their case. I had to bring them up and say, I'm sorry, we're not going to be able to take your case on. And I knew they were going to shout at me, but I had to do it. But God was with me. If we pray about those things, if we say thank you to God, we start to notice him in the small as well as in the big. If we start doing that, we then start changing our mindset to become more like Jesus, to remove that worry, to say thank you to God, to put the kingdom first, to put God first. Then we can start seeking, seeking the kingdom. But it's not an easy transition to make because instinctively we, we worry. We have to almost become a different person. Well, not even person, but it's, as I say, it's part of the human condition to worry. We need to almost go beyond that and get that different mindset, that mindset that's not of this world, that mindset that is of the kingdom, that is of heaven. And as John tells us, or as Jesus tells in John's gospel, I must become less. As John is now, I must become less so that he may become more. And I think that's very true to us today. That we need to become less to allow God to do more. Because if we allow God to do more, we can see greater things. 
as I shared at the start of the service, a PCC met yesterday over the vision day. And part of that was actually, we need to just step back and allow the Lord to speak. Allow the Lord to come in. Allow the Lord to show us things that are greater than we could imagine. Allow us to step aside from our preconceived ideas. Our ideas about what should or shouldn't be happening in this church. We need to step aside and allow the Lord to be in control. To seek first the kingdom. Not our own personal agendas. Because if we hold on to our personal agendas here, we're never going to get anywhere. If we're so set on our own way of doing things, on our own ideas and our own power and authority that we have, we're never going to get anywhere. We have to share that with each other and we have to step back to allow the Lord to step in. So we have to be confident enough to do that. We have to trust in the Lord enough that as we step back, he will come in and do things that are greater than we can imagine. We have to be prepared that if he says, actually, if you think you're going that way, but are you going that way? We have to be willing to do that. I said it before, but if our vision comes out on our needs, it will fail. It has to be what the Lord wants. Do I worry about the future of this church? No, I don't. Because I know that the Lord has got it in control. I know that I've got my ideas of where I want us to be in five and ten years' time. But if that's not the Lord's, well, that's fine. So I don't worry about it. Of course, if I, think, I think about it. I do think about all the things we've got to do as a church, to think where we need to go, what we need to do, how do we grow together, how do we unite ourselves as a family again. I do think all of that stuff, but I don't worry about it. Because I know that the Lord is in control. And I know that in five years' time, we will be exactly where the Lord wants us to be. In ten years' time, we will be exactly where the Lord wants us to be. If he wants us to be a church full of 200 people with three services a day, great, bring it on. If he wants us gathered as we are this morning in five years' time, great, bring it on. It's about making sure that we are committed to what the Lord wants us to do and not worrying. And it's only when we start stepping back, giving God control, seeking first the kingdom of God, we're able to get into that mindset of saying, it's, you, it's over to you, Lord. Jesus concludes the passage by telling us, don't worry about tomorrow, for today's trouble is enough. This is a call from Jesus for us to be living in the present, to be living in the here and the now. Not to dwell on the past. The past is gone. Of course, we can learn from the past. We don't forget it, but we don't dwell on it. But it's also a case of not seeking too much in the front, ahead of where we're going. Because if we're thinking five, ten years down the line, even a week down the line, we may be missing out on what the Lord wants to do today. So if we're sat here saying, well, I wonder what am I having for my lunch, which I've done that in church quite a few times. I'll, I'll be honest. If we're sat there thinking, well, what am I having for my lunch? We might miss what the Lord wants to do in the next 20 minutes of our service. We need to live in the here and the now. And once in my, uh, at, at school, our RE teacher had something on the wall that said, the past is history, the future is a mystery, now is a gift. That's why it's called the present. The past is history, the future is a mystery, now is a gift. That's why it's called the present. Jesus is calling us to focus on the now. He's calling us to focus on what we can do today to bring forth the kingdom of God in Bushmead. He's calling us not to worry about what might happen tomorrow, but to think, well, who can I speak to as I leave this place? Of course, we need to think about the future. I'm not saying not to. But we're focusing and discerning and seeking the Lord's vision for here. It is easy to get caught up into the mindset of what we could be. But focus on the now, the present, because that's what the Lord tells us. So I wonder, are you looking at something in the future that may or may not happen? Are you doing like I do and catastrophizing the worst possible case scenario of what's going to happen tomorrow? Or are you willing to take that step with me and live in the present? To not worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow has enough worries of its own. 
I want to challenge us all this morning, me included, to take our worries, our anxieties, however big or however small, to the foot of the cross. Are you willing to do that with me this morning? Are you willing to do that regularly? Not just do it as a one-off thing today, but to make it part of your life. That whenever you sense that anxiety or worry, you take it back to the Lord. The message translates that last verse as, give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. Are we willing to enter that mindset of seeking what the Lord is doing now and not worrying too much on what might or might not happen? It's time for us to stop worrying about those things. It's time for us to put the Lord back on his throne. It's time for us to remember that the Lord, this is the Lord's church. It's not my church. It's not your church. It belongs to the Lord. It's time for us to stop vying for power and authority in this place. It's time for us to give that authority to the Lord, to relinquish that. It's time for us to claim the Lord's authority over this building, over each and every one of us here, and over Bushmead. God is here now, and he wants to move in this place. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We're going to listen to a song now called Canvas and Clay. It's probably new to most of you, and I don't want us to sing it. I want us to take it as a time to reflect. You might want to look at the words that will be on the screen. You might just want to sit and pray. That's fine. Do what you need to do. But give those worries back to the Lord because he's big enough to take them. Leave them at the foot of the cross. And friends, I beg you, don't pick them up when you walk out that door. Leave them at the cross. We'll listen to a different song. Can you put oceans on, please? <laughs> 